Good morning, everyone, and welcome to GML's press conference announcing the final award on GML's expropriation claim. Uh, my name is Claire Roussagol, um, and from APCO Worldwide, and I'll be moderating this press conference. Um, GML is represented here today on my right by Timos Boone, the company's executive director, uh, still on my right representing the legal team who's led the proceedings on behalf of GML is Emmanuel Gaillard, um, head of uh, Sherman and Sterling's international arbitration practice, um, and Yas Banifatemi, partner at Sherman and Sterling's international arbitration practice too. And on my left, Rodney Hodges uh, from Veteran Petroleum uh, Limited, one of the parties who represents the pension funds for former UCOS employees. Um, Mr. Osborne will give an overview of the ruling and the other members of the, part, uh, of the panel will also be contributing. Um, following that, we will open the floor to questions. For those join, joining on the phone, please note that only members of the press uh, will be allowed to uh, ask questions. Uh, when you do so, please uh, ask, um, give the, your name and the name of your uh, media. Um, at the end of the press conference, we will distribute hard copies of the GML press release announcing the decision and send soft copies via emails to all those attending in person or on the phone. <coughs> I'd like now to give the floor to Tim Osborne. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for coming. Some 10 years ago, having failed to engage the government of the Russian Federation in any meaningful discussions concerning their attacks on UCOS, we commenced arbitrations against the government of the Russian Federation under the Energy Charter Treaty. Those arbitrations are concluded today with the publication on the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague's website of the final awards. I'm delighted to confirm that those final awards, which were unanimous, are very favorable to the claimants, the GML Limited subsidiaries, Hulley Enterprises Limited and UCOS Universal Limited, together with Veteran Petroleum Limited. The three claimants have been awarded total damages of in excess of $50 billion. This is, by a multiple of more than 20, the largest arbitration award ever. In addition, we've been awarded all the costs of the arbitration itself, i.e. the fees charged by the arbitrators and the costs of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, plus the Russian Federation has been ordered to pay us approximately 75% of our own fees. I will shortly pass you to Emmanuel Gaillard and Yaz Banifatimi of Sherman and Sterling, who will go into the final ward in a little more detail. But I do want to note that the tribunal in the final awards specifically and unanimously confirm that in their view, the attacks by the Russian Federation on Yukos Oil Company, its founders, including Mikhail Khodorkovsky and its employees were politically motivated and that the primary objective of the Russian Federation was not to collect taxes, but rather to bankrupt UCOS and appropriate its underlying assets for the benefit of the state in the guise of Rosneft. We're thrilled with this decision. We know it's not the end of the road, but it is a giant step forward. We would not have achieved this without the tremendous work of Emmanuel Gaillard, Yaz Banifatimi, and their colleagues at Sherman and Sterling. They did an amazing job, and I want to take this opportunity publicly to thank them for their commitment, effort, and for the achievement that these decisions represent for them as well as for GML. Finally, I must also thank our very supportive shareholders, the trustees in Guernsey, who thoroughly deserve this result. Thank you. Emmanuel. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is a great day for the rule of law. A superpower like Russia has been unanimously held accountable for its violation of international law by an independent arbitral tribunal of the highest possible repute. As most of you remember, 10 years ago, UCOS had reached the peak of its growth. It was Russia's largest oil company with a market cap of above 33 billion dollars. At that point in time, and now I'm quoting the arbitral award, the Russian state apparatus launched a full assault on UCOS 
and its beneficial owners in order to bankrupt your cause and appropriate its assets while at the same time removing Mr. Khodorkovsky from the political arena. Not my words, those of the tribunal. This is the essence of the arbitral award, which was rendered on July 18, but was under strict embargo until today by order of the arbitral tribunal at the request of the Russian Federation. As of 9 o'clock London time this morning, it is available on the website of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. $50 billion in damages, $60 million in legal fees, $5.6 million in arbitration costs. By all standards, this is the largest award ever. It's more than 20 times larger than what is now the second largest award, which, by the way, was secured by Sherman and Sterling as well, <laughs> Dow versus Kuwait, which was only $2.5 billion, and 30 times larger than what is now the third largest award, Occidental versus Ecuador. The arbitration lasted 10 years. We had a total of 37 days of hearings, including a 21-day hearing on the merits in The Hague in October, November 2012. The hearing was attended by over 50 party representatives. It involved 15 experts, as well as eight fact witnesses presented by the claimants, including two of the beneficiaries of the trust that own GML, Mr. Nevslin and Mr. Duboff. Russia, for its part, chose not to present any fact witness, and that was severely criticized by the arbitral tribunal. The parties filed more than 6,500 pages of legal submissions and over 11,000 exhibits. The transcript of the hearing is over 3,300 pages long. This was a mega arbitration. But I'm happy to say that Russia fully participated in all stages of the process. The arbitral tribunal itself could hardly be of higher repute. The former president of the International Court of Justice Judge Stephen Schwebel, appointed by Russia. Dr. Charles Poncet, former Swiss MP, appointed by the claimants. And acting as chair, the Honorable Yves Fortier, formerly Canada's representative at the UN Security Council, appointed by the Permanent Court of Arbitration. After intense scrutiny and months of work, it took the tribunal more than a year and a half to prepare its award. The arbitral tribunal ruled unanimously in favor of the claimants on all of the following points. One, fabricated tax reassessment. The fabricated tax reassessments which started in 2004, which led to the amount of $24 billion in alleged taxes for a company, the market cap of which was around 30, was not, says the tribunal, a genuine exercise in tax collection, but to the contrary, an expropriation under the guise of taxation. You will read, for instance, Paragraph 756 of the award, which says, quote, after having now traversed at some length the treatment of UCOs by Russian tax authorities, the bailiffs and the courts, and having considered the totality of the evidence, especially the VIT evidence, the tribunal has concluded that the primary objective of the Russian Federation was not to collect taxes, but rather to bankrupt UCOS and appropriate its valuable assets. 
to the rigged auctions a few guns, Neftogaz, and I know that some of you have followed that directly in December 2004. You know, when the journalist laughed when it took 10 minutes uh, to complete the auction. And on that, the tribunal concluded that, I quote, the auction of Ugan's Neftogaz was not driven by motives of tax collection, but by the desire of the state to acquire Yukos's most valuable asset and bankrupt Yukos. In short, it was, in effect, a devious and calculated expropriation by respondent of Ugan's Neftogaz. Not my words, those of the tribunal. On the fourth bankruptcy of Yukos, the final nail in the coffin of Yukos, the tribunal found that, quote, the totality of the bankruptcy proceedings were not part of a process for the collection of taxes, but rather as submitted by claimants. Indeed, the final act of the destruction of the company by the Russian Federation and the expropriation of its assets for the sole benefit of the Russian state and state-owned companies, Rosneft and Gazprom. Taking the case as a whole, the political motivation behind Russian Federation's attacks on Yukos has not been lost of the tribunal, and that's an understatement. Let me read to you, for instance, paragraph 1583 of the award, which goes, the harsh treatment accorded to Mr. Khodovskovsky and Mr. Lebedev remotely jailed and caged in court, the mistreatment of Consul of Yukos and the difficulties Consul encountered in reading the record and conferences with Mr. Khodovsky and Lebedev, the very pace of the legal proceedings do not comport with due process of law. Rather, the Russian court proceedings, and most egregiously, the second trial and second sentencing of Mr. Khodorkovsky and Lebedev on the creative legal theory of their theft of Yukos's oil production indicate that Russian courts bent to the will of Russian executive authorities to bankrupt Yukos, assign its assets to a state-controlled company, we are talking about Rosneft here, and incarcerate a man who gave signs of becoming a political competitor. I should also indicate that in computing the claimant's damages, the tribunal took into account two factors. One, the conduct of UCOS in certain low tax regions, and two, the use by UCOS of the Cyprus-Russia double taxation treaty, which it considered to have contributed to the demise of UCOS and to the prejudice suffered by the claimants. On that basis, the tribunal, and that's the small part, of the victory of the Russian Federation, reduced by 25% what it deemed to be the value of claimant shareholdings in UCOS, hence the final figure of 50 billion after the 25% reduction. But to put this number in perspective, I'd like to say that if you look at Rosneft market capitalization today, the award is exactly 74% of Rosneft market capitalization today. And I take Rosneft not randomly, but simply because as you all know, Rosneft is known as Yukos under a different name. And now my partner, Yasmani Fatemi, who heads the firm's public international law practice, will address the next steps. Yes? Thank you, Emmanuel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before I go into the next steps, I would like to read for you paragraph 1480 of the final award. In respect of attribution, the tribunal concludes that the Russian Federation is responsible for its organs, executive, judicial, and administrative, in the actions that they took against and in relation to Yukos and its stockholders. That the Russian Federation, speaking through its president, accepted responsibility for Rosneft's acquisition of Yugans Neftegas and for the auction that underlay it. 
and that in respect of other actions of Rosneft that bear on the destruction of UCOS. While proof of specific state direction is lacking, it may reasonably be held that the highest officers of Rosneft, who at the same time served as officials of the Russian Federation in close association with President Putin, acted in implementation of the policy of the Russian Federation. In other words, the Russian Federation is responsible for the expropriation of UCOS, but the tribunal acknowledges that Rosneft was instrumental in the destruction of UCOS. As to next steps, the amounts awarded by the tribunal are payable immediately. However, the Russian Federation has a grace period of 180 days to pay without interest. After that period, as of January 15, 2015, interest will start accruing and will be compounded annually. This award makes the case for the importance of international treaties. It was rendered on the basis of an international treaty, namely the Energy Charter Treaty of 1994. On the screen, you can see the states in dark blue, the states that are bound, and these are 48 states that are bound by this very powerful international law instrument. In dotted blue, you will see the states, including Russia, that have opted out of provisional application. In the case of Russia, this is only as of 2009, after Russia, the Russian Federation withdrew of the provisional application of the treaty. But this has no impact on the past investments until 2029. The award will be enforced on the basis of another international treaty, namely the 1958 New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Arbitral Award. And this treaty mandates the courts in 150 states bound by it to enforce arbitral awards without reviewing them on the merits. Here again, you can see on the screen the territorial coverage of the New York Convention. As to the assets that can be attached to satisfy an award rendered against a state, they include assets used by that state for commercial purpose. They also include assets of instrumentalities of that state provided that it can be established that such instrumentalities are the state's alter ego. On that point, the finding of the tribunal on Rosneft will be of particular relevance to us. I will now pass on the floor to Rodney Hodges, a director in Veteran Petrol Limited, the third <coughs> claimant in, this, in the case. Rodney? Thank you, Yes. As a director of Veteran Petroleum, I would just like to add a few brief comments. Firstly, I'd like to thank Tim Osborne and all his fellow directors at GML. Uh, they have provided financial support to Veteran throughout the course of this arbitration. And without this, the legitimate claims of Veteran would not have been pursued. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank Professor Guyard and Yaz and all the team at Sherman and Sterling in Paris for their fantastic work. The Veteran Petroleum Trust, which I helped set up in 2001, is an open and transparent structure a key part of which has been the funding of the Veteran Social Programme, through which tens of thousands of UCOS former employees would receive significant financial benefit. The illegal actions of the Russian Federation starved the trust of the ability to fund the programme for over a decade. And I'm very pleased that the award rendered today uh, now provides us with the opportunity of somehow rectifying this. Thank you. We can now take questions. Yes. <coughs> Uh, my name is Joshua Rosenberg. Um, can you tell me about enforcement of the award? Uh, first of all, can you clarify the position on any possible appeal by Russia? I understand it doesn't have a right of appeal as such. Um, and then secondly, if Russia has not paid the money by mid-January, how will you go about enforcing the award? Will you be able to seize uh, property belonging to the Russian state outside Russia, such as aircraft in uh, um, air, air, airfields around the world outside Russia? Uh, can you um, seek hold of any other property that doesn't have any diplomatic exemption? And is that what you're going to do? Well, first, we have no reason to believe that Russia will not satisfy its international obligations. Second, in the unlikely event they do not, we have 
the law for us, and in particular, the New York Convention. Uh, the New York Convention mandates 150 states to enforce arbitral awards without any review on the merits. Now, as to appeal, there is no appeal. There is a limited action to set aside at the seat of the arbitration, i.e. in the Netherlands, but it's limited control. There is no review on the merits. In a nutshell, they control consent to arbitrate, control violation of international public policy. I don't see any. They control due process. If the tribunal has listened to both parties, the right to be heard, and frankly, the Russian Federation had ample opportunity to be heard in this case. The judgment is there. After 10 years of battle, the tribunal says they violated international law. The, the award is unanimous. That will carry a lot of weight vis-a-vis -vis international courts in every country. And it's very, very well done. It's a lengthy award. They have considered everything. And frankly, we don't win on everything. But it's a judgment. We accept the judgment. This is now res judicata. This is what international law says. Now, the Russian Federation can no longer say, well, we will win. It's sub judice. It will be decided. It has been decided. And now they have to enforce. Now, as to enforcement mechanism, you're right. You attach assets. You attach assets. You cannot attach sovereign assets. You have to attach commercial assets of the state and its instrumentalities. And as to instrumentalities, it will be everybody's guess as to who can be characterized as an instrumentality of the Russian state. The tribunal had some hints on this, but uh, the, it will be for the courts in every country in the world to decide if a state-owned entity is an instrumentality and if their assets can be attached for the debt of the Russian Federation. Thank you. Nick Coleman from Platts. A uh, follow-up question, really. That there has been some precedent for extracting money from Rosneft on the part of UCOS, other UCOS shareholders groups, I think. So have you looked at the precedents for, for this, and are you beginning to work out a strategy for getting the money? And, and secondly, um, would BP, as a 20% as a twenty shareholder in Rosneft, would you be considering legal action against BP? <clears throat> well, I think we, we are working on a strategy. I, I suspect you don't expect us to share our plans with, with, with you, and, and I guess it'll, it'll be in the press. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that nobody's safe. We'll look at everything, and, and then we will we'll take a view, but, but it'll be a pragmatic approach. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Neil Buckley from the Financial Times. Um, uh, two related questions. The first one, again, on uh, enforcement. How realistic is it that the shareholders uh, would be able to gain even a substantial part of this award through the international courts? I, I understand, for example, that the US, uh, US courts have been reluctant to recognize Russian state-owned or indeed any other com country state-owned property necessarily as uh, instrumentalities. Um, and second, I wonder if you could clarify exactly what the implications might be for Rosneft, uh, given the way that Rosneft is identified apparently in this uh, <coughs> ruling as the, uh, the vehicle for uh, the expropriation uh, of the UCOS assets. In, in legal terms, I'm, as I'm sure you know, you have two issues. I'm talking generally here not as part of our strategy, okay. but then it's it's in the public domain that there are two uh, type of issues. One, when you attach assets of the state itself, you can attach assets which are used for commercial purposes and not for sovereign purposes. You cannot attach the embassy. You can attach assets which belong to the state which are not commercial, which are, which are not sovereign, which are commercial. Okay? So then the issue, and the, you've seen the case law in every case, it's what is commercial, what is sovereign. Now, when it goes to the instrumentalities, that's commercial. You don't have that problem. 
then they say, well, it's not us. It's a debt of the state. And then you have to show that they are the alter ego of the state. Each country has its own case law. And there is a test. Who is the alter ego of the state? Who is an instrumentality of the state, i.e. the state itself, as opposed to a genuinely separate, independently operated entity? And that's the debate. It's a fine debate. It's a fact-intensive debate. There is a precedent. It may or may not have been uh, uh, satisfactory, maybe on the basis of different facts. But that's the debate. And, and as to enforcement itself, you see that if you look at history, and history of big or small awards against states, at the end of the day, they pay. Yes, they may negotiate. They have something to negotiate, which is the time it takes to argue all these issues. But at the end of the day, the awards are satisfied. So it may be another long battle unless they pay immediately, because after all, Russia is part of inter the international community, and they may want to play by the book at some point. But if they don't, the law is there to remind them that they have to satisfy international awards. Neil, if I could just, sorry, I could just follow up on that. Your, your, your question was, um, did the shareholders believe that they would have a realistic chance of, of um, collecting? And I think, I think the answer to that is, is very simple, is, is yes. They're, we believe we will have a realistic chance of collecting. We didn't go into this for a Pyrrhic victory to make a point. We went into it to get compensation for the loss we suffered. And, and we looked at the whole thing when we started. And we, we still believe that we will ultimately collect on this award. Thank you. And just on my second question, which is the, the specific implications for Rosneft, uh, given the, the weight that uh, Rosneft is given in this ruling as a, as a vehicle for uh, expropriation of the assets. Could Ro how can Rosneft be pursued? Can it be pursued through international courts? Uh, can its assets, even within Russia, be pursued as a result of this? Well, Russian courts have not been known so far in the UCOS context for their independence, so I'm not sure they would uh, change overnight. But elsewhere, it will be for the courts to decide whether Rosneft is the alter ego of the state. That's the issue. And again, uh, as, as you will have seen from the excerpt that I quoted, the tribunal has found that Rosneft was the alter ego of the Russian Federation in relation to this particular case, the destruction of Yukos and the appropriation of its assets for the benefit of itself and Gazprom. Any other question? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Rankin at The Guardian. I, I know Mikhail Hodorkovsky is not a party to this case, but I wondered if he made any comment to you on the, on the outcome. Um, <clears throat> the only comment that we've had is that he is not any party of, to this case, and he wishes as well. Uh, Neil Buckley again. Uh, this is obviously an award in favour of the uh, largest, the majority shareholders of UCOS. Could you um, comment on any implications this may have for uh, minority shareholders, of which there are tens of thousands, uh, in terms of uh, them uh, getting back some of their investment in UCOS? Well, I think there are, there are two aspects to that because the um, minority shareholders break into two groups. There's, there's the European group, which <coughs> would have the benefit of double tax treaties in the Energy Charter Treaty, and I would have thought this award, which will ultimately get translated into a per share value, would encourage uh, some to bring similar actions. The US shareholders, of course, um, do not have the benefit of the Energy Charter Treaty or of a double tax treaty, and are dependent upon the State Department uh, espousing their claim to their Russian counterparts. Um, 
as you know, uh, the State Department is mandated by the Magnitsky legislation to um, look for compensation for the UCOS shareholders, and I would have thought that this award would incentivize them into making more progress on that, but that's just a personal view. Mr. Gaia, you, you said that uh, sovereign states generally do pay in the end in these cases, but my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, is that Russia has had three previous investment arbitration rulings against it uh, and has not paid uh, in those, uh, or in two of those. Um, in one of them, uh, some assets have been recovered, but only through a very lengthy fight by um, uh, the claimant. Yes, I was referring to the case law overall. Prior to the Argentina crisis, all, um, almost all of the ICSID awards, one type of investment arbitration, have been satisfied, other than in a rare instance. Instances, uh, Argentina is starting to pay, and of course, the proof that these awards have a financial value is that you have lots of banks which are prepared to buy them. There is a secondary market, if I may call it that way, for arbitral awards. They buy it as a discount, because the discount is their perception of the value of the time it will take to enforce and the effort you will have to put. But they also want to have a benefit. As far as we are concerned, I don't understand that we want, I say that for those who have approached us already, we are not in the mood of selling these awards, we are in the mood of enforcing these awards. But the very fact that there is a secondary market for international awards and that people already want to buy these awards means that they have a financial value, just not a moral value. But if we pause for a second, the moral value is extremely important for all of us. That said, we will still enforce, and the financial value is there as well. We'll have uh, one last question from Echo of Moscow Radio Station, or somebody. Yeah. Gentleman, you had a question. Yeah, read from the New York Times. Um, just a factual question: Is it is it fifty billion, or ex, you keep saying excess? Is it? Well, it's fifty plus. I mean, it's in excess of fifty billion. It's not. It's not a round number. We say fifty billion, but it's not a round number. It's a. It's fifty billion. And twenty million eight hundred and sixty-seven thousand seven hundred and ninety-eight plus costs, plus fees. It's yes. the website of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. CPA.org. And you will have it under cases. It, it has been published under cases. Uh, Donna Tsikirka, Associated Press. Mr. Osmore, do you think that there's a larger message here for potential people who are interested in, in investing in Russia? There is. I'm not sure what it is, but there definitely <laughs> is. Um, uh, I mean, I think it now is a, a, an unfortunate time to be be talking about Russia, but, but generally I, I think the message is that, you know, Russia is a land of opportunity, but you need to make sure that you have access to uh, some binding dispute resolution mechanism that is not dependent on, on the Russian judiciary. So I think as, uh, if you're investing with the benefit of a double tax treaty or a multinational treaty or some arbitration clause that allows you to arbitrate disputes uh, outside of Russia, then, then I think it, it, there's still an opportunity. But I, I suspect at the moment Russia is not a place where many people are going to be investing. If I could just follow up on that. I, I guess what, if I could also ask, do you think that the way Russia responds to this ruling is going to be important for future investment? Yes, because if it, if, it inve if it responds positively and, and, and deals with us like we've been trying to get it to deal with us for the last 10 years, then that will send a, a very good message. 
Um, equally, when we enforce it, um, that will send a good message as well because it will prove the, the point I was making um, first time round. So I think either which way, it, it, it's, a, it's a positive message. But certainly, if Russia was to be constructive in its response to this award, that would be the best message that it could send to, pu to uh, future investors. So perhaps one last question from Echo of Moscow Radio Station. Do you expect Russian Federation to grant the full amount, amount of compensation to GML? When could it happen? Uh, I don't know how long that piece of string is, but I do expect to collect the full amount in due course. <laughs>